Hello and welcome to Train News, where much like Crossrail, we are late. On that note, let's start with Crossrail slash the Elizabeth Line, which was supposed to open in December 2018, but didn't. In August 2018, it was revealed that the opening of Crossrail would be delayed until some point in 2019. Then at the beginning of December, we were told that it would be delayed even further. This is pretty bizarre, given that at the beginning of 2018, the project was being reported as being on time and on budget, and was hailed as a great example of a large project that's been able to stay on time and on budget. And yet, here we are, with the project set to be delayed by over a year, and at least £1.7 billion over budget. So it's 2019 and even if Crossrail doesn't open this year, there are still a number of important things to look forward to, including the May 2019 timetable change, which includes a lot of the uh, improvements that were deferred from May and December 2018. Let's hope this one goes a little bit smoother. In the past two or three years, there's been a lot of rolling stock orders being placed and 2019 is the year that a lot of those new trains will enter service. On Northern, we're set to see the introduction of both the Class 195 and 331 Civities, the 195s having already started testing in 2018. TransPennine Express is set to introduce the first of all three of its new fleets this year, the Mark V carriages, which were actually meant to enter service in December, but were delayed due to some error with the brakes, Class 802s, and last but not least, the Class 397 Civities, the first of which has now arrived in the UK for testing. Greater Anglia is also set to introduce the first of each of its new fleets, the Class 720 Aventura, the Class 745 Flirt EMU, and the Class 755 Flirt Bimode. On Great Western, the final Class 800 has now entered service, amazingly before a single 800 was introduced on the East Coast, and even the Class 802s have now started entering service. Electrification on the Great Western has also reached Bristol Parkway and Newbury. Meanwhile, ScotRail has introduced the first of its new modified Inter 7 City HST sets. Southwestern Railway is set to see the reintroduction of the Class 442s, affectionately nicknamed as the Plastic Pigs. Also set to enter service this year, the first Viva Rail D trains, the Class 230s, which is set to be introduced in the West Midlands and also in Wales and the first of the Class 769 Flex Unit on Northern, Great Western and in Wales. Since the last episode, Keolis Army have taken over the Wales and Borders franchise. The Welsh Government, who now control the branding, have decided to call the train company Transport for Wales, which is a pretty shit name for a train company, actually. Anyway, TFW had a bit of a rocky start due to a lot of leaf fall and uh, a temporary shortage of train carriages, but they seem to have recovered from that. Meanwhile, some of the planned improvements in December 2018, including services over the Holton Curve, have been deferred. Then let's talk about the Gospel Oak to Barking Line, the Goblin, where the introduction of new Class 710s has been severely delayed. This might just lead to a ridiculous situation where the existing Class 172s are moved off to West Midlands before they can be replaced, meaning that London Overground would have to replace trains with buses until the 710s enter service, which would be insane. There is speculation, however, that there might be just enough time to train enough drivers to use the Class 378 or the Class 365 Happy Trains on the route. It would be nice to see the Happy Trains save the day once again. Network Rail have announced funding for a brand new project to reveal one of the most congested parts of the railway network. No, it's not Platform 13 at Manchester Piccadilly, it's in Croydon. East Croydon is set to receive a new platform and the track layout north of the station is set to be simplified to reduce track conflicts. Which is great, and I'm all for this project, but why is this same thinking not applied nationwide? In October 2018, the Sheffield to Rotherham tram train finally opened after being delayed by about 48 years. The mood was slightly dampened when one unlucky Class 399 was involved in a collision with a truck. On the first day, you can't make this shit up. This year, work is finally set to begin on the Trans Pennine Upgrade Scheme. Electrification of the Victoria to Staley Bridge line, which is technically not part of the scheme, was supposed to be finished about three years ago, and it is still progressing, as seen here. However, there is a lack of clarity over exactly how much of the route will be electrified. Given Network Rail's rather traumatic experience at Farnworth, it seems very unlikely that the Standedge Tunnel will receive overhead electrification any time soon. Grayling's current thinking, and I use that term lightly, is discontinuous electrification, which is basically overhead wires with gaps making it super inconvenient for most trains to use. 
Now, of course, you could fill those gaps with sections of third rail, such as the Standage Tunnel, but I don't think anybody in the DFT has thought of that. Many news outlets ran headlines expressing outrage that upgrading a rail route involves some actual construction work. In other words, closing lines temporarily. I mean, it's easy to laugh, but remember, this is the north of England. We're not used to this kind of thing. Speaking of wires, I am ecstatic to announce that electrification has finally been completed on the godforsaken cursed, the line that must not be named. Yes, it's the one you think it is. It's the one that rules the roost. Here it comes now, the Bolton Chorley Preston line. It was originally supposed to be completed in December 2016, and the last minute announcement that it wouldn't be ready for May 2018 was one of the major factors behind the collapse of rail services after the new timetable was introduced. The irony is, as a result of that collapse, the December 2018 timetable has now been deferred, meaning that Northern won't actually be able to take advantage of the electrification being completed until next May. In October, an ICE train caught fire on the line between Frankfurt and Cologne. There were five injuries, though thankfully no deaths. More recently, there was a very serious accident in Denmark on the Great Belt Bridge between Zealand and Funen, with eight deaths. As mentioned in the last episode, as a result of the May 2018 timetable chaos, many improvements and on Northern, TransPennine Express, Thameslink, Great Western and other operators in December 2018 have now been put on hold. Some changes have been made. On Thameslink, for example, the December date saw the full introduction of the May 2018 timetable, which was cut back in July. Many passengers expressed annoyance that Thameslink was advertising this as 200 new services when they weren't really new. One major change that has taken place on Trans Pennine Express is the splitting of the Manchester Leeds shuttle service at Huddersfield, with the two shuttles picking up some of the local callings from the Hull Express. This was one of the messier bits I pointed out about the May 2018 timetable, so I'm glad they sorted that out. There's also been speculation that Northern is set to lend a few of its recently acquired Class 170s to Trans Pennine Express to operate the Huddersfield to Leeds route which would make this the first time that Northern and TransPennine are lending each other trains at the same time. There's been one operator lending trains to the other ever since 2015, when TransPennine Express lost its Class 170s to Chilton, so I guess some things really do come full circle. One of the less operationally significant but more talked about changes in December concerned the infamous Paddington to West Ryslip and sometimes High Wycom parliamentary service. This service runs along a little used line bridging the gap between the Great Western Main Line and the Chiltern Main Line, which was once the Great Western branch to Birmingham, and runs parallel to the Central Line. Anyway, this line is being used as HS2's Get Out of London free card, and as part of early HS2 works, the junction between the Great Western Main Line and this line has now been severed, so the parliamentary service has been redirected to start from West Ealing, and now runs along the Greenford branch. In November, the Minister for Transport and Rail Minister, Joe Johnson, resigned, citing the government's failures over Brexit. The Department for Transport are currently in a state of review mania. There are four main reviews going on at the moment. The Transport Select Committee's review into the May 2018 timetable disruption, Stephen Gleister's review into the May 2018 timetable disruption, the Williams review on rail franchising, and the so-called Root and Branch review into fares. Now, with that very last one aside, because I do think a genuine rethink of fares is needed, and I've already made a video all about that, the other three are just delaying tactics to avoid having to make any actual changes. I mean, the causes of the May 2018 disruption are already well established. If you ask me, journalists and enthusiasts seem to have much better insight onto how the railway actually works than DFT bureaucrats. Or at least their findings are easier to decipher by the general public. Just read City Metric, for God's sake. An example that illustrates this quite nicely is another minor report that's been commissioned by Chris Grayling and Andrew Haynes into the situation at platforms 13 and 14 at Manchester Piccadilly. Did you really think we'd get through an episode of Train News without me bringing this up? The kicker is, this report is not set to be completed until summer 2019. I mean, what even is the point? What is it that takes nine months? What are you even going to find that hasn't been established already? Network Rail did the background research ten years ago. Rail passenger numbers have only grown since then. If he wanted to, Chris Grayling could find out everything he needs to know just by speaking to passengers or rail staff who have the misfortune of travelling through or working at Platform 13. In fact, I dare say he could find out everything he needs to know just by reading the letter I wrote him, which he definitely didn't read. I'm not one for giving up, so I decided to write him a sequel. Let's wait and see how patronising the response to this one is.
Uh, what else? Oh yes, um, as the investigations into the May 2018 disruption wind down, the fate of Govia Thameslink Railway has been sealed. And to nobody's surprise in particular, they have been allowed to keep the franchise. But they have been fined £15 million, which they have to reinvest into improving passenger services. Which essentially means they'll have made pretty much no substantial profit this year. I mean, it's better than nothing, but you know, it's not really a punishment. As per Northern, no action has yet to be taken over May 2018, although the DFT did make a surprising U-turn by suggesting they supported Northern keeping a second member of staff on board all trains. Northern and the RMT then met at ACAS whilst passengers held their breaths, and the dispute was resolved. We have Saturday services back. Hurrah! Only joking, Northern refused to commit for that second member of staff to be specifically safety critical and negotiations promptly broke down and the Saturday strikes are continuing into the new year. Once again, owing to both sides being full of uncompromising ideologists who have little interest in providing a passenger service, even the long sought after passive DFT intervention failed to resolve this dispute. Despite the fact that pretty much the exact same thing seemed to work just fine for Merseyrail, the only thing that can save the situation now is an active DFT intervention, and for that we need Chris Grayling to blink. Unfortunately for Northern passengers, Chris Grayling's probably busy doing something else, like, I don't know, preparing for no-deal Brexit by paying £15 million to run ships to a shipping company who don't own any ships. I don't know, that was just the most ridiculous thing I could think of off the top of my head. What? What do you mean, spot on? And we close with the predictable yearly outrage over the annual fare rise, 3.1% on average this year, slightly lower than last year, but still it stings in particular given just how shit 2018 has been for rail passengers. Let's hope 2019 is more than exactly 3.1% better. And um, that's it for train news until June, I'm afraid, as it's my level year and what time I will spend on YouTube I will spend on uh, secrets of the Metrolink and other things. So we will check in on how 2019 has been for the rail industry in the next episode. Thank you for watching, and please subscribe. Oh, and just before I go, a quick self-plug. History of the Metrolink, which has been about a year and a half in the making, has now been released. Go check it out. It also comes with a bonus feature all about the history of Manchester's railways and the Northern Hub.